Kitchen Table Seed House is an on-farm organic seed producer of vegetable, flowers, and herbs. We're very interested in a regional seed system. It's getting harder and harder to find heirloom varieties and varieties that are adapted to our region. And so it, we thought it was a good idea to add seed production to our region, our agricultural region. And uh, we want to breed new varieties that will do even better in our locale. A lot of seed is being grown in, in very specific areas because it's the best geography-wise, best weather-wise, but that makes our system really fragile. It's important to be a little more resilient, maybe focus a little bit more on our local uh, production, no matter what it is. We have a bit of a microclimate on Wolf Island, which is nice. We often get showers that come through that Kingston itself may not get. I mean, there's a deep agricultural history to the island as well, back from the 1700s, so we're, we're being well supported by the community. My name is Kathy Rothermel, and our farm is Kitchen Table Seed House. Fat Chance Farmstead is a certified organic fruit and vegetable farm. Um, we, uh, we produce uh, vegetables for a food box program where people come to the farm and they pick up their box of vegetables each week and then we also specialize in uh, certified organic strawberries. My partner Jen and I were living out in, uh, in British Columbia and we moved to Kingston where Jen is from and we knew we wanted to start a farm when we got here. This was back in 2012 and then by 2017 we landed on this property here and, and yes yeah, so we've been farming now for, for eight years. We were always growing strawberries, but then um, John Wise, who's up in Centerville, who had been doing um, uh, certified organic you pick strawberries since, I think, 1978. And so we transitioned to take that business over, essentially, and so that's how that kind of happened. I've been working in agriculture a really long time, and I've worked for a lot of different farms. So what I like to say is my farm is more of an inventory of innovations, more so than me having any of my own good ideas. So I can walk around my farm and say like, oh, I got this idea from this farm, this idea from that farm. And so I really compiled a lot of, a lot of great ideas and also been able to avoid a lot of bad ideas. You know, we all, we all kind of have the same goals in mind. We all have the same struggles and, you know, we need to have some solidarity. I think that's really, really what it's all about. Like farming isn't easy. You're not making a lot of money farming. And if we can, you know, if we can all help each other, we're all gonna, we're all gonna succeed. My name is Josh Supan, and I run Fat Chance Farmstead. I love the piece in your video, Josh, where you say that it's uh, your farm is an inventory of other people's good ideas, and you don't have to come up with your own good ideas. I, I that must speak to sort of the interconnectedness of the agricultural community. For sure. Very cool. And Kathy, when in your video, um, there's a scene where you and Annie are uh, uh, pouring uh, fruit onto a, a screen and then sort of um, uh, mashing it into the screen. So is that sort of the first step in saving seed? Uh, each seed crop is quite different, but we call tomatoes a wet seeded crop. And what we do is we mash up the fruit by rubbing it over a screen or using, uh, we easy, even use an end of a two by four as a, as a mallet to crush the fruit. And then we let it sit for three days, generally speaking, to ferment. Um, there's a gel coat around each seed capsule and, and tomatoes, and um, it's full of germination inhibitors that will prevent the seed from germinating. So we need to remove that gel coat uh, because it's slimy for starters, but we do that with the fermentation process and the uh, microbes in the gel coat will start to ferment and uh, be eaten and uh, eat, eat the gel coat around each seed. And so what you were seeing there is the first step of it is crushing the fruit and then the next step is, is sitting, letting it sit for three days. And then you saw some of, there was a jar that we were pouring seed into. Mm -hmm. So that's after the three days 
um, then we're cleaning the seed by decanting off the material that sets, that uh, floats to the surface. And then we're left with heavy, clean seed at the bottom of those jars that we then decant onto a screen and dry. Okay, very cool. So we have uh, five, I think there's five attendees here, and, and one of them is a class from the grade five, six class from Winston Churchill. And we have a number of questions that they submitted in advance. So I think what I'll do is just jump into those questions and uh, Kathy and Josh, feel free to, to jump in with answers wherever you like. And then as I said before, for anybody who's on the call as an attendee, um, please feel free to ask a question at any time, either through the Q&A uh, panel or by raising your hand. Okay, so we'll get into the first question. So um, how can you tell that soil is healthy? What are some of the telltale signs? Josh, do you wanna take that one to start? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of different ways to tell if um, soil is healthy. Um, for one, if you um, uh, if you're, you have your hands in the soil and you're finding lots of, um, lots of bugs and worms, um, that's a good sign of a lot of activity. Um, which means you have have a living soil, which is um, uh, which is kind of working um, working alongside you. Wonderful. Do you have any additions there, Kathy? Sure. Um, I, I was just reading um, <clears throat> about a farm a soil health specialist, and he was talking about going out into your field and taking a shovel full of soil. This is something you could do even in your backyard, and uh, <clears throat> putting the soil, uh, a shovel full of soil into a box or onto a screen and separating it all out and counting how many earthworms you have in that one shovel of soil. And if you have 20 or more, you have really healthy soil. So if you don't have any worms in that shovel full of soil, you're in trouble because you don't have anyone helping you keep that soil healthy. Okay, so lots of earthworms equals healthy soil. So um, I'm not sure if it's a, a question exactly, but leading on to that, how do we make soil healthier? Or, or what do you do to make your soil healthier on your farm? Josh, go ahead. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, so we, um, uh, we do a variety of things. One thing that's, um, that's really important on our farm is we do something called cover cropping. And so that means we're planting we're putting plants in the ground essentially, seeding things that we aren't going to harvest. Um, and their, their sole job is to basically feed the soil. And so when we're not growing strawberries or vegetables, um, we'll plant things like oats or peas or buckwheat and many other things like that, that are, they're gonna, they're gonna grow in the soil and then eventually we'll work them, work them back into the soil and that will become food for those worms and those bugs and then also the the smaller biodigesters as we call them that you um that you actually can't see with your eyes and that's just that's helping feed them to keep them uh, keep them growing and to multiply so you end up with 20 worms per shovel full so is it safe to say that um if you don't have worms in your shovel shovel full it's because they don't have food to eat they don't have any of that good bio material to consume well that's part of it <clears throat> yes, that's that's true. And uh, the other thing that we try to do on organic farms is do less tillage. So if you think about your soil as uh, a city full of high rises and schools and churches and all sorts of buildings, if you uh, do a lot of tilling, every time you, you pull your discs or your plow through the soil, you're tearing down those high rises and parks and schools and rearranging them. Um, and so it takes time for the community, the soil community, to rebuild itself every time you drive through or pull any sort of piece of equipment through your, through your soil. So we do as little tillage as we can get away with. Um, we still do some because we have heavy clay soil in our area and uh, in the springtime it's quite compacted from the winter, winter season. Um, but so that's one other thing that we do to try to keep our soil healthy is to limit the amount of equipment that we pull through a field. Okay. 
And so another question from the Winston Churchill group that's uh, along the same lines here is, uh, what can I do to make the soil in my yard healthier? So if we're not thinking so much about a garden or a farm field, um, what can we do about our yards? Kathy, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I, this, I'm really excited about that question because I think um, there's lots you can do on your own in your own city uh, yard. And one thing that we really like to promote for backyard gardeners is um, mulching. So if you have a garden in your backyard that you've grown some vegetables in over the season, instead of leaving it, pulling out all the plants in the fall and leaving it bare soil, it's a really good idea to bring in some mulch, some straw, or maybe uh, leaves that you've collected from your yard and, and put a layer on top of your vegetable plot because that's like a nice big heavy blanket that's going to protect your, uh, your, uh, your city of, bio, of uh, biological creatures in the soil. Very cool. And Josh, you talked a little bit earlier about cover crops. Is that another job that they do? Is, is there anything about protecting the soil when they're actually sort of living on top? Yeah, sure, of course. It's, it's always good to not have bare soil. Um, it, uh, it prevents erosion, um, the, the drying out of the soil from the sun. Um, it also helps inhibit weeds, so it stops weeds from growing if you have a, a crop already um, in, in your field or your garden. Um, uh, and then, and then as well in the winter time, whether your cover crop died in the winter because it can't handle the cold or if it lives through the winter, it's also just keeping a cover on there. So you're not going to have your soil wash away. So yeah, it, it, it plays a multiple, multiple roles for sure. Very cool. Okay. In the, in the fall, when we get the heavy rains, if your soil is bare in the backyard, you're, you're getting a fair bit of leaching of nutrients out of your soil. And many people have raised garden beds in their backyards and that really promotes leaching. So it's, if you can cover it, um, that's one thing you can do. I, I think it's a great idea if community, I know the community gardens have done this in Kingston, uh, where they'll go together as a, as a group and buy one bag of fall rye, for example, or um, fall rye is a really good one and then share it amongst gardeners. So, because you only need, you know, a couple of cups of seed if you're doing a 10 by 10 plot or so in your backyard. So that's a way that you could share in doing a project that would definitely promote your, uh, a healthy soil in your backyard. Wonderful. So when we talk um, about healthy soil, uh, uh, healthy soil will produce healthy plants. So a plant gets its nutrients from the soil, how does that, uh, I assume, how does that work? Can you, um, can you start us off there, Josh? Uh, yeah, so once again, when we're talking about feeding those worms and those beetles, what they're doing is they're breaking that, the plants down, that, uh, that the cover crops down or the leftover plant material from the fruits and vegetables that we were growing. And then they, essentially the worms and the beetles, they, um, um, I mean, there's no other way to put it. They basically, they, it's their waste, so they poop it out, and then it's in the soil, and then that that becomes food for your your plants in the future, um, because they uh, your tomato can't eat um, fall rye, but your tomato can eat what the worm when the worm had eaten the fall rye, if that makes sense. So that's that's kind of how how uh, how that works. Right. So then when you put the tomato seed into the soil, how does it get those nutrients? It just sort of absorbs them from the soil? Kathy? <clears throat> sure. Um, so plants are a, an incredible uh, ability through their root system to access um, nutrients uh, through the soil. And not only are they they're uptaking um, nutrients, but also there has to be a really critical balance. There's a, there is a critical balance between the amount of water and the amount of oxygen and the amount of nutrients in the soil. So there's a intersection between those three components of soil that allows the plant, and this is the biologist would have to weigh in here on, on more particular details and maybe your teacher as well, uh, on the actual process of of uh, the plant's ability to dissolve um, minerals, calcium in particular, phosphorus. There's a, there's a balance between all of the minerals in the soil, in healthy soil, that allows the plant to easily take up 
um, nutrients that it needs to be healthy. Um, but this, the balance between the amount of uh, air and water and uh, organic matter in the soil is, is really critical. And it's one that we have to work hard at in our area in Eastern Ontario because our soils are pretty heavy. So there tends to be less oxygen available. Um, in Western Ontario, it's much more loamier soil. It has more uh, humus and um, it's, it's lighter. And so it's uh, easier for plants to, to do what they need to do to stay healthy. We can still do it here, but we have to work a little bit harder. So what kind of things do you have to do? Um, I assume, you know, if there's not enough to maintain that balance, if there's not enough water, it, it must be fairly easy to add water, assuming you can get it. What do you do if there's too much water, if there's too much rain? Yeah, I mean, I, that's uh, more of a long-term solution, right? Um, uh, the, more, the more organic matter you have in the soil, um, the, the more ability the soil will have to um, absorb that, uh, that moisture. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's where the soil building and building healthy soil kind of comes into, comes into play. Um, and also good site selection, right? Like not everywhere is ideal for growing, growing vegetables or annual crops. Sometimes certain areas are just better for perennial crops or just grassland for pasture for animals. So it's like, that's, there's kind of a few moving parts there, but yeah, if it's raining all the time, there's, you know, you just, sometimes you just have to wait it out or I don't know. Yeah. Do you have anything else to add there, Kathy? Uh, there's quite a number of farmers in, on Wolf Island and in uh, Kingston area that do put in drail, uh, drain, tile, uh, drain tiles. Mm -hmm. So they actually go, they make big trenches through their fields and they lay a pipe uh, about 24 inches deep and that acts as a drainage system in the spring. Um, I'm not sure it's allowed in the organic system. Yeah, yep. it, okay, so that's a, a method of, uh, of uh, uh, increasing the soil's ability to drain in the spring because that, that's when the biggest problem is, is in the spring when you wanna get on the field early to get your crop in, but it's too wet. So mm. uh, tile drainage uh, is a, uh, a, a way of monitoring or uh, um, modifying your fields to allow you to get in. And I think it's like up to two or three, it makes a difference of two or three weeks, which it was a big window for uh, grain crops, cash crops in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, we're experimenting a little bit on the other side of that. So we're, we're trying to do raised beds. Um, I've seen it done in um, Japan where on quite heavy soil, they've made basically little mountain peaks in their fields that might be 18 inches high and they're one right next to the other in long furrows and so then in the spring you you get drier soil in that top part of, of your bed it does work we did plant peas that way this spring and uh, we got them in earlier than we would have if we just planted into the flat flat beds flat field interesting okay so long term pay attention and build healthy soil Pick the right uh, pick the right site, and then there are a couple of different ways you can manage uh, drainage on your on your site as well. So very cool. I do have a question here uh, that's been submitted by one of our attendees, um, and maybe Josh, if you can address this first. Um, the question is, how late in the season can I plant a, a cover crop: ryegrass, clover, buckwheat, radish, on exposed soil? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the cover crop. Like um, buckwheat is something you would not be planting now. You'd be planting that in June or July um, as it, it needs the warm weather um, to, to grow properly. Um, we grow, we plant a lot of oats and peas. That's something you're going to want to plant in late August or maybe early September. But if you want decent growth, late August is better. Um, and then on the later end, um, fall rye, um, and vetch we often plant vetch with our fall rye you'll want you can plant that i mean i've had it germinate as late as planting it as late as november 1st but really like i'm hoping to get all my fall rye in by the end of this week if you want some decent growth but it'll it'll grow pretty late and same with winter wheat like you could plant winter wheat as late as say the third or fourth week of september but you're not going to get as good of growth if you don't plant it uh plant it a bit earlier than that Cool. And is there, um, are there certain advantages to different cover crops? Is it a matter of, um, 
or is it just a matter of sort of rotating? So you wouldn't plant the same Crova crop this year as you would, or, or as you did last year? Is it just rotating or are there certain advantages for certain crops? You wanna go ahead, Kathy? Sure, yeah, uh, there's definitely um, windows of opportunities to grow as, as uh, Josh has mentioned. Some grow just better at certain times of the year. We are also, you know, back to innovation and what happens on the farm. You pick ideas from other farmers and we attend workshops and all sorts of things to try to get a better handle on what might work or you know, get ideas about what might work on our farm. Um, last fall, we planted uh, fall rye with oats and oilseed radish. And uh, the radish actually came up the best. And we planted that, I believe, September 15th. Um, so we had lo lovely, nice, green, leafy, radish-looking leaves in the snow when the first early snow came last year in November. Um, we don't do soil testing, but lots of other farms do. And sometimes those tests will show that there is a lack of a particular nutrient. And so you might try to address that lack with a particular cover crop. Oh, okay. um, I couldn't tell you specific. For us, we're just happy to get a cover crop in the ground because it's just, it's, there's so much happening in the fall uh, through harvest season that uh, it's, it's just really, we're, we're just happy to get anything in the ground, to be honest, at this point. But um, in the spring and summer, where you have a little bit more time to play with, um, yeah, buckwheat, buckwheat's a great one. Uh, the clovers and alfalfa have really nice deep root systems. So if you're, if you're doing a crop rotation, um for more than it like if you're putting for us for seed crops we like to have a longer rotation because the seed takes a lot of nutrient out of the soil so we like to plant clover and alfalfa which do better if they are in the ground for a couple of years the seeds expensive and it's really nice to have them be able to uh, have two years of growth so you really get the maximum benefit of their root systems which grow very long and deep if, if given the chance so it's a whole, it's a whole nother thing. Cover crops is, is a really exciting um, proposition and there are more and more people who are just kind of getting on board with the idea of even growing a cover crop. So it's exciting. Very cool. So you started talking a little bit about harvesting there, Kathy. So let's switch gears and talk about sort of the other end of um, the process and, and talk a little bit about harvesting. So how do you know, this is a question from, from Winston Churchill, how do you know when vegetables are ready to pick? Josh, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, it depends on uh, depends on the vegetable. Um, sometimes it's really obvious, like if a tomato is red, it's time to pick that tomato. Um, with things like um, like lettuce, we want it to be a certain size before we pick it. Lettuce is a crop that you can pick anytime. You can oh well, not anytime. You can pick it as tiny as you want. Eventually, it'll get it'll get big and might start going to seed, and then it won't taste very good anymore. So you want to pick it before that. Um, Carrots, it's all about size as well. A bit harder to tell with the root crops when they're ready, but, um, but you know, you can dig a few up or sometimes you can see them a bit on the surface of the soil, but it's, uh, it depends on the vegetable and you just have to, have to keep your eyes on it. And there's an old saying, um, the eye of the farmer fatteth the cow. And what that means is if you're an attentive farmer or grower, um, you're gonna have, you're gonna have better food because you're keeping your eyes, uh, eyes on on your crops so that's a good philosophy so think, go ahead Kathy I think that's a, a really good point that uh, good farmers are observant and an awful lot of knowledge is gained by being out in your field and taking a look every day at your crops as especially as they get close to maturity because there's very small windows where it's really at the top of its game where it's really like perfect and if you're in the market gardener world, that's when you want those crops to go to. You kids who are going to be cooking with your parents in the kitchen, um, you want that. You want to have that just that right window. So observation is just critical. And as Josh said, it depends on the crops. Uh, each one is different, but um, tasting them out in the field. If it's fresh green beans, you're going to taste them. And if they're tasting good and looking good, then that's the day to pick. <laughs> so um, we know that uh, certain vegetables come into season at certain times. Do you have much um, power to control as a farmer um, 
sort of when you can put them in the ground? Like, could you plant tomatoes way earlier and then they'd be ready way earlier? Or is there a certain sweet spot where you kind of have to plant certain vegetables at certain times? Kathy, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, again, it depends on the crop. Uh, crops that are originated in warm climates, there's a smaller window. So tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, we plant as early as we can because they need a long, hot season. Um, but there are many other crops that uh, you can grow later in the season or we just did it. we're doing a radicchio trial right now. Um, we have seven varieties of radicchio and we planted them in the middle of July and we're just eating them now and they're gonna be good for like probably the next two weeks. Josh, you might wanna come and have a look. Um, and so some things you can plant in the spring and some things later in the summer for a fall crop. And things, but things like lettuce, you can plant every two weeks through the whole season, and which is what market gardeners do so that you get a fresh crop every two weeks um, because their season is so, so short. So you need to plant repetitively through the season. Okay, that makes sense. Do you have anything to add there, Josh? No, I think that was pretty good. So I have a couple of specific questions. Um, uh, one of them is, how much soil do you need to grow potatoes? Josh, do you do potatoes at Patchen? Yeah, we do. Um, uh, well, we, my farm, we're up in Harrow Smith, um, and they call Harrow Smith the um, the gateway to the um, Canadian Shield. So that um, should tell you that we don't have a lot <laughs> of soil here. Um, we have spots on our farm that we've got no more than six inches of actual soil depth. Um, we try not to farm on that too much, but there are some spots where we do. Um, the more soil you have, the better your crop is going to be. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how much soil you need, but you probably want it like 12 inches minimum would be would be pretty nice. So, but people grow people grow potatoes in buckets and in in like big bags or in raised beds. Like potato, yeah, you because you can just keep piling more soil on top of potatoes. Um, it's it's kind of a fun thing uh, fun thing to do. But uh, yeah, the more soil you have is always better than less soil. But we all don't have the same things to work with, so. So I'm going to jump to one of the other questions uh, off of what you just said there, Josh, you talked about raised beds. If somebody wanted to start a garden in their backyard, um, ha hasn't gardened before, um, whether it's whether they do raised beds or, or just in the ground, is potatoes a good crop to start with? Or what would be your suggestion on a crop to start as a gardener? Me or Kathy? Go ahead, Josh, and then Kathy can chime in. Yeah, I mean, um... Um, potatoes are potatoes are an easy one easy one to grow um, you know you just throw the potato in the ground um, starting a garden with transplants so there you can you in the springtime you can you can a lot of local farms sell transplants like tomatoes peppers kale cabbage things like that transplants are really easy to start with too because the plants already already growing when you put it in the ground um, yeah that would be those would be my thoughts Kathy, do you have a suggestion for a place to start? Yes, I think a, a great place to start, especially with kids, is with peas and uh, beans. They're nice direct seeded crops. It's a nice large seed. Um, you can uh, and you can easily space them out. Um, whole beans are really fun for a small space. Um, if your mom or dad can build you a trellis, then you can grow whole beans, and then you can stand and pick your beans when they're ready, which is kind of fun. And it also makes a pretty uh, pretty wall on the edge of your garden. Um, and as Josh says, the trans, it's, it's easy to buy tomato transplants or peppers, a couple of each, and, and then you've got a ready-made plant to pop in the ground and uh, watch it grow through the season. Awesome. And what then is, harvest all those delicious tomatoes for <laughs> August eating. What is your favorite vegetable to grow? Kathy, you wanna start with that? I really like beans. I, and it's funny because we always talk about what, what you grew, what you ate as a kid and how that influences your future, future likes. And my mom used to cook uh, green beans with um, uh, caramelized onions. And I just thought that was the best thing ever. So I really like growing beans as well because it partly reminds me of when I was a kid when my mom made this bean dish. 
That sounds delicious. And Josh, what's your favorite vegetable to grow? Uh, I never ate this as a child um, <laughs> or even as an adult until maybe 10 years ago. Um, but it's uh, kohlrabi. Kohlrabi is my favorite vegetable to grow. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a really weird looking vegetable. It's in the same family as broccoli and cabbage. Um, we grow we grow a ton of them. We grow um, a fall kohlrabi, a lot of them, and they can get like bigger than my head. And we don't harvest them till after it gets really cold and they're quite sweet and they store very well. Um, I love kohlrabi. <laughs> so how do you prepare it? Do you, would you cook it up like you would a broccoli or what's your favorite recipe? We eat about 95% of them raw. There are great, in the winter time, there's not a lot of raw vegetables you can eat. Like there's carrots and there's not much other than that. And so kohlrabi is another great raw crunchy vegetable you can eat. Our kids love it. Um, you just, you cut the skin off and then you cut it into sticks and then you just, you munch away on them and they're, they're awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Kohlrabi. Um, there's a question here from uh, a student in the Atlas 8 program. And his question is, how were your crops this year? Kathy, do you want to start with that one? Yes, well, uh, we, we started off really well in uh, April and May. And uh, then we had a uh, hailstorm here on June 14th, I think, with hail the size of marbles. And uh, everything was planted out in the field, the tomatoes, the peppers, flowers, the peas, everything was out. And we got hammered for about 90 seconds <laughs> and uh, so we went out the next morning I couldn't quite handle going out that day of the storm and the next day um, our lovely tomato plants which were probably about a foot and a half high were all that was left was just the the main stalk so we were a little worried um, but it's amazing how resilient plants can be and uh, the tomatoes, uh, many things were knocked back a little bit. So we're harvesting later than we normally would in other years because things took a, a little while to recover from the storm. But um, I, I think it's actually gonna be a pretty good year for us. Um, we did lose most of the peppers and they did not recover. So our pepper crop was, was much less than other years, but the tomatoes have all bounced back and um, even the onions, it looked pretty sad after the storm. Uh, we, we got some nice, good-sized onions for one of our breeding projects. So you, farmers are funny, funny folks. You ask them any time during the season, and it's a lot of, oh, I don't know, I don't know, it's going to be a bad. <laughs> so we don't like to be count our chickens before they're hatched, as they say. But uh, now we're into September, and most of our, a, a good poor 80% of our crops are in, and, and it's looking good. So thank you for asking that question, because... It's very dear to farmers' hearts. How how were the hard, how did the harvest go this year? It's pretty incredible to know that you know all of your hard work leading up to that storm in in June was so impacted by ninety seconds. Like, mm -hmm. like that's pretty incredible when you think about your entire season and just ninety seconds having such an impact. It's the first time we've hit hit by a hailstorm in twenty years. Uh, other areas have had hail over the years, but it's the first time that we had hail, and uh, we're just so we were so grateful that the greenhouses did not blow away. We probably had fifty knots of wind for that ninety seconds, so shredded a lot of leaves off the trees, and uh, the the front porch was covered with uh, marble sized hail. It was unbelievable, very shocking. So. Josh, how were your crops this year at Fat Chance? Yeah, that same hailstorm put um, a single hole in one winter squash plant, and that was it for me. Wow. So we, yeah, we had, it, 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 it didn't affect us at all, which was, yeah, we were pretty worried as well. Um, overall, our season's been really good. Um, it was super dry for a really long time, but I mean, it's been, this is the third year in a row where it's just been bone dry, basically from mid-June till sometime in August. Um, there's a, there's a friend of mine up in Centerville who does, um, he, he does, uh, uh, like, he's an independent weather observer and for, for Environment Canada. And so in June, they received 28 millimeters of rain. In July, they received 28 millimeters of rain. And then in August, they received 128 millimeters of rain. So a big difference. And the majority of that rain in August was at the end of August. So it tells you how much rain we got. Um, we water a ton. 
now. We just, I used to depend on the rain a lot. I don't depend on the rain at all anymore, except for our cover crops and field crops. But, um, but everything else, we just water it a lot. And yeah, it's probably been one of our better growing years, actually. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just how much we've been irrigating this year, just really, just really pushing the envelope on that. So. Wow. So um, Kathy and Josh, I assume you're both on a private well. So you have a well on your property. Is that how you water your crops, Josh, is just through your own private well? Or do you have to bring in water from somewhere else? Yes. So we, we have a really good well, which is rare for the area that we're in as well. Most people don't have good wells, but ours is fantastic. And so we trickle fill from our well, which means it slowly fills up uh, water tanks. We have huge water tanks that fill up. And then, uh, and then we have a one horsepower pump, which is a pretty big pump that then, uh, then pumps the water from the tank out to the field. And then we irrigate in a wide variety of ways. Um, on our old farm, we did not have that sort of system. So we were trucking in water. And so we were paying a company to come in and fill up our water tank on a regular basis. And then I think it was 2016, it was so dry and it was getting so expensive that I started trucking the water myself and it became a full-time job and it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty exhausting, so. Wow, and Kathy, do you have a, a sufficient well on Wolf Island as well? Um, I think organic farmers in general like diversity in all things, including where their water comes from. <laughs> so we collect rainwater off our barn we have a big old barn, uh, so we have several big tanks that fill from there when we get rain. And we also have a pond, so we're, we're pumping up out of the pond into one of the tanks in the barn and then drip irrigation out to the field. But yeah, we did a lot of watering this year as well, it was dry. Um, we, do have a, we do have a well that we use for the greenhouse greenhouses um, that we pump out of into tanks that are in the greenhouse. So water is definitely, definitely an issue and um, I don't I don't anticipate that our dry summers are going to go away I, I don't know that it's hard to predict we don't know what's going to come for uh, the future years but um, right now it seems we're in a dry dryish spell so mm -hmm. I have a question here that's just come in from um, Erin Coble, who I think is the teacher with the, the grade five, six class at Winston Churchill. And she says, your answers have been great. Thank you so much. One more question if there's time. What is the most rewarding part of being a food growing farmer? Josh, do you wanna start? And then Kathy, you can add some thoughts. Sure, yeah. Um, I think all farmers grow food. Um, uh, and um, I think the most rewarding thing for me is just, having that, we have a direct connection with all of the people who eat our food. We pretty much sell everything directly on the farm. So people come and come and get the food. And so we get to meet them. And um, we just know that we're, we're one part of the, um, uh, of the community food system. And that's, uh, that's nice to know that we're a part of that. Wonderful. Kathy? That's a great question. And one, I, one we talk about a lot because it seems that we're in a time in general in society where we're being asked to uh, quantify so many things in our in, in in what we do and i think farming is a lot about qualities that we can't measure so the satisfaction that josh is talking about with meeting folks who are eating your food it is a very heartwarming connected feeling of doing something really good for our community. And that, that's how I feel. I feel, I love being out. I love being out in the field. I love working outside. It took me a long time to figure that out, but I really <laughs> like that part of it. I love the seasons. I love the way it changes, uh, the job changes season to season. Um, I used to not like winter, but now I love winter because it's a, it's a change from the heat of the summer. <laughs> but I think thinking about I like thinking about the food system in, in general and, uh, and then the seed system in particular. And, and Josh and I, Josh is also part of the National Farmers Union and we, we really believe strongly in the family farm and having people growing food close to where we live and work. And we're, we're, that's what we believe, that's a, that's, we value that idea of growing locally and having people in our community eat the food that we grow here. So I think that's, I like that. 
Those are wonderful answers. And I think that's what, uh, you know, that speaks to the spirit of Open Farms and the reason we're doing this event now for the third year in a row. Um, it's really about, you know, bringing um, all of the amazing things that you guys do and that passion that you have for um, producing healthy food for your communities and trying to really help the people who eat that food or who could be eating that food connect with you. So sort of fostering that connection. So it's really wonderful. Thank you for that question, Erin. That was, that was great. And your participation and your class at Winston Churchill has been fantastic. Um, there's another question here from Gary, and this is back to water. Um, and I think maybe specifically for you, Kathy. So are there concerns with pumping water from Lake Ontario or the St. Lawrence River if you have an organic garden? Is there a lot of residual uh, biocide in the water? Can you answer that one, Kathy? Uh, that's a good question for the Water Keepers Society or Water <laughs> Keepers Association as far as what's actually in the water these days. I do know there's one couple on Wolf Island, they're long-term residents, and she drinks the water directly out of the river on the north side of the island here, and she says she will do so until the day she dies because she should be able to do that. So am I doing that? No. Um, I don't think there's a problem pumping directly from the lake onto your farm. I, I, I haven't heard of anyone having any issues that way. Um, I mean, all the municipal water systems up river are, are treated as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I couldn't answer specifically what is in the water, but I, I don't know of any problems. And that's a, that's a great question, Gary. And like Kathy said, um, the Waterkeeper Society is a great resource. You can probably find them online. And if not, I could always um, send you the link after um, our session as well. So we've got- As an, Go ahead, as an organic, as a certified organic farm, we do have to test our water, um, uh, both for washing our vegetables. Um, well, we, yeah, we use the same water for washing our vegetables as we do for irrigation, but so you have to do testing. And I know we had looked into, into digging a pond and we spoke to our certifier and there would still be lots of testing that would have to be done, especially when you're drawing surface from the surface water. But, um, but yeah. That, that's not for using on the field, but that's for cleaning and processing vegetables. It's definitely right, absolutely. It's for us. We, we had to, uh, so our house water is on a UV system, et cetera. And that's the kind of system you would need, need in place if you were using your uh, stored rainwater or pond water for processing vegetables yes right. okay so if you got your well water tested and it didn't meet the standards for organic you would have to put a system in place that would um that would kill bacteria or what would be in the water that's not allowed it's bacteria. yeah because it's going on food that's out to the uh, to the uh, like right to the public right so yeah you can't you can't have things like e coli um getting onto the uh um getting onto your food through the water so okay that makes sense. And, and we have a really good system in Kingston. The city of Kingston runs the, uh, the water uh, testing service right down there by the courthouse. So you just go in with this, a water sample. They send it into the lab. It comes back to you whether uh, you've passed or not. So yes, that's definitely part of uh, any vegetable growers uh, in the area is uh, part of their protocol. Okay, very good. So we have about nine minutes left until 1030 when we're going to wrap up the session. So if there's any attendees that have um, a question they really want to get answered, if you can pop it into the Q&A or raise your hand and we'll make sure we get that answered. I've still got a number of questions here, so I'm going to keep going with those, but I'll for sure look at yours if you if you pop it in. So here's an interesting one, again, from that Winston Churchill group. How can you tell if plants or trees have a disease and why does this happen? I assume the why is probably quite dependent on the plant or the tree and the disease itself. Um, but maybe the, to start with, how can you tell if a plant or a tree has a disease? Josh, do you want to start there? Yeah, um, observation is the biggest one. So looking at the, uh, at, 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 the, at the plants and knowing what to look for um, is, is kind of kind of key. I would say that's what we do. We, um, uh, we, we're, we're always on the ground, like checking out and seeing what's, uh, what's happening. Um, whether we take action is another um, is, an, is a whole other question. Like um, we we try not to use outside inputs if we can. So if there's a like if there's a, like a fungal problem, like some sort of mold or something like that, if it doesn't seem out of control, I typically won't do anything about it. Um, uh, we had um, we've had an issue on our on our apple trees for the last couple years with um, really bad cedar apple rust, and so we have been applying. 
um, something called Bordeaux mix, which is, um, uh, it's just, um, well, technically speaking, so it's copper sulfate and lime, and you just mix that together and spray it on the plant. Um, but you have to be careful, careful with stuff like that. It's fine for um, organic production, but you still don't want to use too much of it. And so we, we just do our best to make sure there's not a lot of weeds and there's good airflow, and that kind of controls um, a lot of the fungal issues we would have on our farm. So when you're out there observing in the field, what are some signs of disease? Would it be mostly like a discoloration of the leaves or? Yeah, like spots on the leaves and, and, and stuff like stuff like that if the plant doesn't look, uh, look the way it normally should. Okay, and so if you decide not to treat something, um, there are some diseases or, or um, uh, you know, molds or whatever that will just resolve themselves, they'll just get better? Mm, maybe, or they just are, are, aren't, um, aren't, out of control enough that I'm too worried about it. And I mean, sometimes I've been burned for doing that. Like it all of a sudden it just spreads like crazy and then you've got a huge problem. Um, but, uh, but having a good diversity of crops um, reduces that problem. Because if you have, say your tomatoes have, a, have some sort of issue, but then you've also got 25 other types of vegetables that aren't affected by that, then you have less tomatoes, but you have plenty of all these other things and that kind of, you know, it kind of equalizes it. Okay, interesting. So a disease that a tomato plant might get um, will not spread to a potato plant or it's very difficult for that kind of spread to happen. That's what you're saying? Sometimes, sometimes they can. Potatoes and tomatoes are very closely related. So they can, they can share, share with each other if they want. Okay. Kathy, do you have any comments on the plant disease front? Uh, well, I'm a big tree fan, so I've, we've been planting trees here at the farm since we arrived here in 2001. Um, a lot of the trees were cut off Wolf Island in the 1840s, uh, when the British were uh, sending mostly pine and uh, oak back to Britain to build uh, uh, um, their uh, navy. Um, so we have, don't have a lot of trees left on Wolf Island, which always surprises me. Um, but I, I think looking for disease, so we've had sugar maple with the nice black spots on it, and you've probably seen some of those in the city as well. It's a fungal disease. Um, if the plant is healthy, if the tree is healthy enough um, with its location and it's happy, it can usually fight off some of those diseases. Um, and I guess we're, we're, kind of of the belief here that if a tree doesn't make it, uh, we replant it with something else. So there's great genetic diversity in your tree stock. And from the reading I've done over the years, um, you want tough, hardy trees and you don't want to baby them. You want them to be able to handle the situation that you have on your farm. So we've planted a lot of white uh, spruce because the deer don't eat them. Um, this year we've got some issues with uh, gypsy moth in the black walnut, but it's a really nice big healthy tree. So I'm not too worried. I haven't treated it. Um, and we'll see how, how it does in the spring. But we also, like Josh was saying, instead of planting a whole group of trees of the same variety, we'll plant a mix of trees. So deciduous. And uh, so we've got catalpas and uh, sugar maple, burr oak, uh, black walnut, choke cherry, a variety of ones. And we try to find the place on the farm that they do the, the best. So that because if it's how if the tree is healthy and happy, then you're going to have less disease issues. So that's really critical. Sometimes trees get diseases because they're just planted. They're not happy in the spot where they're planted. Yeah. Kathy, you mentioned gypsy moths and that brings up a, a whole other topic about bugs. And I know Bugs on a farm are good, um, but there are some bugs that are not so good. What do you do when you are um, when you have too many of one kind of bug or or the wrong kinds of bugs? Is there anything you can do as a farmer? Um, so my philosophy is I don't use any sprays, uh, even the ones that are allowed in the organic uh, protocols. Um, we use row cover, so we have definitely a flea beetle issue in the springtime on our brassicas, cabbages, and uh, kale, etc. So we do cover them when they're small, otherwise it will be eaten. Uh, and we're also working with plant breeders down in the States. Uh, they're doing, you know, the job of a plant breeder is to come up with a variety that is less 
uh, prone to some of the bugs out there. So we're hoping to breed varieties here on our farm that have more resistance to the bugs that are endemic to our area. It's called horizontal resistance. So the idea is that you have a plant that, that is, uh, has enough genetic base that you, yes, you're gonna lose a percentage of your crop, uh, but you won't lose all of it. And you live with that percentage that you lose. Anyway, that's another whole big topic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any comments? Um, we try to, so we basically, we try to grow varieties that don't have bug problems. Um, and that's tough as Josh knows. <laughs> so squash, some years we have great squash crops and other years they just get eaten to the ground with a uh, cucumber beetle, squash beetle. There, there are a lot of bugs out there that like vegetables. Josh, do you have any comments on bugs? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with the fungal pressure, or even the weed pressure, like we, we permit a certain amount of it. Um, I'm definitely proactive. It's not like I go out there and I just shrug my shoulders. Um, having healthy plants really helps. Like we had this spring on our cucumbers and winter squash and summer squash. At one point, we had 30 cucumber beetles per plant. It was out of control. Um, but the plants were healthy and 95% of them outgrew the cucumber beetle and we've had we had great crops of all of them like we had a fantastic cucumber year and Yeah, so the health of the plants um, we use row cover as well, which kind of keeps keeps the little plants um, Little plants a bit more protected, but the day we took that row cover off You could see the cucumber beetles literally flying in to where the plants were like they didn't they didn't waste any time um, but yeah, it's just uh, having a diversity of crops really helps and just yeah, being observant and getting in there. Like sometimes we go through and we're squashing bugs with our fingers or yeah. Wow. Uh, that's, that's what we do with the, the tomato hornworm. So we, ha we have a lot of tomatoes planted here this year and uh, tomato hornworm, those big green worms with a little horn on the end. Uh, and we just hand pick them and it's labor intensive and but at the scale that we're working, it still makes sense to do that. Um, if, if you're any bit, you know, scale of economics, if it's too, if you're working with a larger population or more acreage, it wouldn't make sense to do it necessarily by hand, but that's what we're doing at this moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I wanna say thank you so much to Kathy and Josh for sharing with us your expertise. Um, you know growing plants and vegetables sounds like an easy thing to do but obviously there's a heck of a lot more to it than that um, i want to say thank you to all of our attendees for submitting great questions and being engaged in this session um, this is the first one of our six in a series of open farms sessions um, you can find the schedule online two more of them are going to be in the morning like this and geared towards children and then the three evening sessions will be Slightly more complex, but um, we'll post them online after the fact. And if you want to watch them with your class, then by all means, that's um, that's a resource for you too. Before we go, um, I want to thank uh, the Frontenac um, Farmers, um, sorry, the Federation of what am I trying to say here, the FFA, um, who supported us in, in developing this uh, Q and A series. Um, and Kathy and Josh, before we go, do you have any uh, final thoughts that you want to share with the group? No, thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your interest in farming in our in our area, and I hope that you. What we'd really love to see in our community is one gardener per family. So maybe you would might like to be that gardener in your family, and maybe today you've inspired to grow some more vegetables. I like that challenge. One gardener per family. Wonderful. Okay, thanks everybody. I hope you have a great day, and uh, and stay tuned. We'll post this online so you can see it again later on. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.